welcome to Re-Raid Request, where two college professors take a second look at questions and answers from around the internet and from you, the listener. My name is Professor Will McBurney. And I'm Professor Mark Sheriff. And today I want to start with determining just how much older I am than you are. Okay. I have a question I'm very excited about. All right. Are you ready for this? Are you ready, McBurney? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Okay, this is a pre-question. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, the pre-question is, what was your first video game system? This is not the, you know, deep, meaningful question. So this is where I, I think I have to say an NES. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was afraid um, you were going to be like Nintendo 64 or my, something like so that. So no, no, no. God, that came out when I was seven or something. But we had like an NES. The, the Super Nintendo came out when I was a kid. And I remember we would rent it from the... Uh, we would rent a Super Nintendo from the mm-hmm. Giant Eagle video store uh, when I was living in, in, in Morgantown, West Virginia. There was a video store attached to the Giant Eagle, and we'd always like rent a Super Nintendo for a weekend. Okay. All right. yeah. But you had an NES. I had an NES, correct. Okay. So, I mean, so, so Super Mario Brothers, my first... Tetris, Golf, uh, Donkey Kong. Uh, sure. Ju- Donkey Kong, not Donkey Kong, but Donkey Kong Jr., I should say. And Lolo. I swore you those, said Junkie Kong. The Adventures of Lolo. Those were the games that I had growing oh, okay. up. Okay. Yeah, all right. Very good. I mean, technically, my first video game system was the Sears Master System, yes, which yes. is a, a television clone. Yeah. But that leads us to our first question. And being someone who had an NES, mm-hmm. you will be able to comment on this. The question is, why did you have to blow into an NES cartridge to make it work? Did doing this actually help at all? If so... How? And uh, of course, yeah. there is magic yeah, in magic. the breath yeah. of every small child. Oh no! When it you was picked more than up that. The- you, you, it was a ritual. It was. It was. It was, a it was a summoning. Yeah, <laughs> it was a summoning. Yeah, I declare, here comes you Mario had to get, and yeah. the Tanuki suit. <sighs> you had to get your Eye of Toad, right? You had to get your your um your fingers of. I don't know. Uh, children will go with like whatever, whoa there, whoa, whatever whoa, whoa, summoning whoa, whoa, whoa. ritual you needed to do. You know, you had to wave it back and forth, but you had to do it exactly three times, four times, and you were going to damage the cartridge. So you can't do it four uh. times. You had to do wave it back and forth three times, right? You had to do. You had to do, of course, the dance of ages, uh, as as we know. Um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It was it was a long and involved process uh, in order to get the game to work. But it was a thing. I mean, everyone knew yeah. that that's what you did. You had to blow into the cartridge then, to make it work. And this now, was pre-internet age, which is what makes it so interesting to me. Oh, yeah. Now it's like, oh, well, something's viral. That's because of the internet. How did this become viral? Um, there's a lot of, like, viral stories for, about video games, especially from pre-internet age. For example, uh, in Pokemon, moving the truck to find Mew was like a a legend that everyone in my school knew that wasn't true, that you couldn't actually do. Um, Hmm. But but this could... And and so my question is, as we answer this cartridge question, it was it actually blowing helped, or was it, uh, in fact, not helpful, or was it something else? So I think that's what we're going to get into with this question, which I think is Uh, super interesting. Oh yeah, and I did I did some research. I don't know how much you know about the whole mm-hmm. the whole background of all this. And one of the more fascinating things that I learned when I was researching this was we all know how the original Nintendo worked. It mm-hmm. was a front load system and then you pushed down on it. Yes. I didn't know until I started doing research that that was an intentional thing done by Nintendo for specifically the US audience. Now, if yes, you've ever correct. seen a Super Famicom, yeah, if you, it's, it's sorry, a Famicom yeah. system, it was top loading. And it was like it was like and, a disc, effectively. Uh, it was still eh, it's like it a, was a disc attachment. Yeah. But, and then um, the later re- uh, new edition of the NES that was released was also a top load. Correct. And at the time of the original NES, this is the time of the VCR. It's Correct. the same, the mid '80s. And when you put in a VHS tape, it would go in and then go down exactly. in order to come into contact. And so. At the time, Nintendo was marketing the NES not only as a video game system, but they were marketing it as um, a, a, like a home appliance. Mm-hmm. And that was one of the ways they were trying to break the the curse, so to speak, mm-hmm. of the video game crash of 
uh, the, about 1982, 83, uh, the, the, the famous burying of the cartridges in the desert, yeah, yada, uh, yada, which, which, by the way, is, I actually, actually have true. one of those cartridges. Oh, you do? It you is, have one that's buried in, yeah. I do. <laughs> I have, I have a, uh, uh, a, an Atari cartridge that mm-hmm. was be- buried in the New Mexico desert. It is in my office. Yeah, uh, wasn't and I it will like never AVGN open the bag. Did, AVGN did a movie about the E.T. Atari game, which involved mm-hmm. actually going and digging up these cartridges in the landfill in New Mexico. Right. Like, it's, 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 it's so, a real, it's, it's one of those myths that is actually true, unlike oh, blowing yeah, on the cartridge, which we'll get into. Definitely not a myth. I have the physical proof. Yeah. I can show it to you. So this is an important aspect of the story, because... When you put the cartridge in and you push down, that was what created the contact yep. between the circuitry of the NES and the board of the NES cartridge. A front, a top load push down cartridge had a much firmer connection mm-hmm. between the cartridge and the system. And so that's what it, it did not have near as many issues as this kind of faux VHS interesting way of, of touching it. Mm-hmm. So what was actually made uh, and, and made it work was the act of just putting the thing in and then trying again and again until you happen to get the connection right. So mm-hmm. the blowing, one theory says it did nothing. Yeah. Right. And it was just the act of putting it in. Mm-hmm. The other theory I love even more, though, which is it wasn't the blowing of the dust. It was the moisture of your breath right. that gave a little bit of just, you know, kid juice in there <laughs> so that the electrical connection right. was just a little bit better. Um, so did it help? Kind of. Yeah. But th- but it was more the act of, of when you took it out, it kind of bent the pins into the right position. And then when you put it back mm-hmm. in, it was there. Now, I this is the truth. I, st- I still have an NES... But yep. if you put like the it it's it's busted enough that it still works. But if you put it, if you put the game in and push it all the way down, it doesn't work mm-hmm. because the the pins huh. are bent inside of the NES, so it won't make mm-hmm. contact. Um, if you put if you put the game in and it's still all the way at the top, it doesn't work. There's no contact. It's about halfway between the two. And so the way that I make it work is when you when you push the game down, you don't push it down the hallway. You put it shit just enough that you can shove a pencil between the top oh of the God. plastic <laughs> bit that holds the cartridge <laughs> and the case. And if you put a pencil there, then that's the perfect amount of, like, down such that it makes perfect content and works completely fine. So if you shove a pencil in my NES, it works fine. Plays everything. Oh my gosh! It, yeah. it, it it became, it became this weird, uh, um, secondary uh, set of, of 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 tips of the other ways to make your cartridge work. Another one that that did apparently work very well worked for me as well um, was a game genie mm-hmm. because once you shove that sucker that game genie which had a much firmer connection yeah. than the original cartridges anyway you shove that sucker in and you just never took it out right. and if you didn't take it out you are now working with a solid connection between the yes. cartridge and the game genie even if once you, the yeah. game genie had a solid connection with the NES. Do we have to explain what a game genie is now? We probably should. So, I mean uh, that yeah. that actually no honestly no seriously will in another in another episode, yeah. we should talk about how game genies work yeah. and talk about That's true. editing code on the fly. I think yeah. that would be good. That but is really true. quick. That is good. A, game, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, a game genie is uh, wasn't an accessory that Nintendo hated um, that mm-hmm. um, edited bits and bytes on the fly between the cartridge and the NES and allowed you to do weird things like it would allow you to overwrite the part of memory that kept up with the number of lives you had in Mario. So when you would die, the cartridge is like, oh, you lost a life. And the game genie is like, nah. Yeah. And it would just not change that bit. It reminds me of a, of, a, of a fun Mario ROM hack called Mario Frustration, and uh, where a guy has W Blue Sky lives left. And if you've never seen it, just look up Super Mario Frustration. And it's a guy who has like a, a New Jersey accent playing this incredibly difficult ROM hack. It's hilarious. Uh, one thing I do want to note, though, is mm. um, so with the with the with the cartridges, one one of the things that they should note is um, that 
the reason we've moved away from cartridges is is because discs are much cheaper. But it's also why sure. you you needed things like memory cards for a long time with discs because cartridges effectively were like a separate computer that you were plugging into a computer more or less. Right. And whereas discs are just here's here's a bunch of data that you can't change. It's just there. And the console had to do all the work. But that was why, for example, the Nintendo 64, even though it's a, it was an incredibly popular console, by comparison, it was considered a failure because PlayStation 1 was bigger. And the biggest reason for that really was the price of the games. You know, PlayStation 1 could sell games for like $30. Nintendo was selling for like $60, $70. And that was in 1990s money. Oh yeah, the licensing fees for for printing on the official cartridges was definitely yeah was was very oof. yeah. So anyway, I wanted to open with yeah. with that one because that just that one just made me feel good. You have, no. you have one for us? Yes, I do. And this one, I actually have quite a bit to say about. First, uh oh, let me go should ahead. I just go ahead and mute my microphone? Well, first, it's it's going to I have it's a long question, and I want to kind of explain it real quick. So first. Does anyone else hate how the internet now feels like seven major websites, which are all interconnected, whereas it used to feel like a vast place with something new around every corner? So, for example, this is actually a, a, a meme version of this is, you know, um, in, in now in 2021, there's four websites. There's Facebook, there's Twitter, there's Instagram, and there's Reddit. And or the, Tumblr is kind of in there, too. So five. And every website is just sharing pictures from other websites. So Twitter is sharing pictures of Instagram. Facebook is sharing pictures of tweets. Instagram is sharing pictures from Facebooks. And Tumblr is also used in Facebooks. all of them. Yeah. So like every so there's so few websites now, whereas there used to just be so many. Like there used to be, for example, I can has Cheeseburger, a website dedicated to pictures of cats misspelling things. Right? Um, can I interest you in everything all of the time? Yeah, yeah. To to, to reference the the absolutely fantastic, uh, absolutely if, if fantastic. You, if you haven't watched it yet, go on. If you have Netflix, go on Netflix. Watch Bo Burnham's Inside. It is it is one of the most bizarre things I've ever seen, and I mean that in the most positive way that I can say. It, it's phenomenal. It's powerful but, on so many levels. But there seem to be so many fewer websites that you interact with now as compared to, like, for me in high school, for example. The, the number of websites I interact with feels like it's decreased. So, so... Interesting. So here... So do you have any kind of thoughts just after I pose this question? Do you, do you disagree well, with the premise or well, as soon as you said, it, I started <laughs> thinking about. I, I looked over at my own bookmarks, mm -hmm. and I was so what, what, so. what am I looking at? And it's typically Twitter. <laughs> it's where it starts. I stopped doing Facebook because I just couldn't um, with with some things I was seeing there. Not that Twitter is terribly much better, but um, that would definitely got to me. But I read Polygon for video game news. I read the New York Times. I read mm -hmm. Nintendo Life, We're which is talk just about a Nintendo the New York blog. Times in a second. Go ahead. Okay, that sounds great. Uh, and then I have a host of Hearthstone websites that I read with different deck codes and things like that, but that's pretty specialized. So, um, yeah, I, I do remember, you know, I Can't Has Cheeseburger. Uh, there were other um, web comics. I used to read a ton of web comics. Now I just have a manga sort of aggregator on my phone. So I have specialized apps that, that I suppose provides that content mm -hmm. as opposed to having quite the, the number of different specialized websites that I went to. I mean, I understand. I certainly understand where the premise is coming from. Um, I, I just wonder if that's more of a way uh, around how people have uh, how people digest content mm -hmm. nowadays um, rather than um, how the content is being produced. But anyway. Well, so, OK, so there's a few reasons for this. So first uh -huh. is. Um, now, for example, you interact with a lot of websites through, say, Facebook or Twitter. So oftentimes the first you'll see a okay, news true. story is through Facebook and Twitter. But the question is, sure. why? Well, this gets to how are you fundamentally getting this information? You're getting this information from somebody else sharing that information, right? You're not a first right, source. You're not right. even the first person to see the website often. You'll right. see someone else share it. And so 
in order for that to happen, you have to be engaging in some type of social network. Right. Makes sense. And because of the nature of social networks, you know, why do I still have a Facebook, for example? I don't have a Facebook because I particularly like Facebook. I don't. I still have a Facebook because I use it to keep track of my friends from college, primarily. Um, you know, for, that I still stay in touch with. Because they have it. So I'm on the website, not because I like the website, but because people I like are on the website. And, and, and as the internet has trended more social, social forces play a lot bigger role in what websites you use. You know, back in the, the right, early right. eras of search engines, you know, if you used Ask Jeeves and I used uh, Profusion, right, we, we'd get different websites, but oh well, who cares? Mm -hmm. um, now a lot of us use Google. I, I use a lot of DuckDuckGo as well. But that's because those search engines largely have kind of become, have, through social forces, have become very popular. But there's a, there's a deeper reason here. And, and I want to note something. So first, I, I mentioned we we're going to talk about the New York Times. So let's look okay. at the top newspapers or, or periodicals by, subscri by internet subscription. So online paying subscribers. Okay. The New York so Times. New York yeah, New York Times is the number one in the world. It has the WAPO probably Washington Post. Well, so, is New, hang there. On. so New York Times has six uh, okay. six point one million. That number is going to be important in a second. So just think six million. Washington okay. Post, next one okay. down, has three million. Okay. The Wall Street Journal, the next one down, has two point four million. Gannett, okay. which is uh, the USA Today, effectively, that is okay. over one million. The Athletic, which is actually now being bought by the New York Times, I believe, but it's like primarily sports. Um, it is about a million, but it's not actually, they don't publish their numbers, they're privately owned. Financial Times, sixth, under a million. The Guardian, 900,000. The Economist, 800,000. Notice that the gaps between those numbers seem to be trending to actually be smaller. News Corp Australia, 685. Barron's, 500,000, Tribune Publishing, Chicago Tribune, 425. There's actually a mathematical thing at play, and it's kind of spooky. And it's called Ziff's Law. Z-I-P-F. Ziff's Law. See, I thought you were referring to Ziff Davis of I IGN Media, no, but okay. No, so Ziff's Law. So roughly, for the New York Times, it's 6 million subscriptions. The Washington Post is about half of that, at about 3 million. Right. The Wall Street Journal is about a third of that, at 2 million. Gannett is actually above 1 million. It's close to a fourth, technically closer to a sixth, but let's allow, let's allow for some fudging room here. It turns out that there's this weird pattern that emerges a lot, not just in human interactions but in nature so for example the english language the most common word is the the next mm -hmm. most common word is of it appears half as often if you take a, any any large collection of english text of will appear about half as often as the the next most common word will appear about a third as often the next most common a fourth as often again of the and hmm. a fifth and a sixth and it turns out that this is spookily accurate to where if you pick a word and you know how many words are in your corpus that you're using and you know the rank mm -hmm. of that word, you can get a very accurate estimate, often within 5% up or down, of how many times that word's going to appear with any sufficiently wow. large corpus. Wow. Okay. And the interesting thing is that this, isn't ju this also appears with English letter distribution, not just English word distribution. E- T is about half as common as E. O and A are about a third to a fourth as common as E. O and A, it depends on if you're doing scientific or, or more prose. A is more common in prose. O is more common in scientific. But the next letter, about a fifth as common as E. And this pattern appears not just in the English language, but in Spanish and French and Latin and also every single language that we know of, including ancient languages that we can't translate. The symbols that appear adhere to this pattern called Ziff's Law. Hmm. And the idea is you get this, in, you get this 
very tiny group of things that account for almost all of the words. You know, the right. um, like you, you get this small group that accounts for almost all of the words, and then you get a lot of words that account for a very small proportion. Now let's translate that to the internet. You have a small number of websites that account for the largest amount of traffic, and then you have a lot of websites that get almost no traffic at all, and then in the middle you have a bunch of websites that get some, and you get this diminishing curve. And it Uh turns out that that curve of website traffic also adheres to Ziff's law very closely. The same law that I talked about with language. So what you're telling me is that global AI is controlling us all. I think it, well, I mean, yes, jokingly, yes. <laughs> but no, I, this is actually spooky to me. Like this, so like when you ever, well, when you yes. ever hear the Pareto 80-20 rule, that emerges sure. out of Ziff's law. So for okay. example, yeah, let's okay. say you wanted to be in the top 10% of streamers on Twitch. How many average viewers do you need to be on the top 10% of streamers on Twitch? How many average viewers? I, I, I actually used to... The, I was, uh, right now. 100,000. To be in the top 10%. Not, not views, top. but a- average viewers during a, during a stream. Not total views. Oh, du- oh just during a yeah, stream. During a stream, what are the average oh. stream views that you need? It's like, it's like 50? 50? It's, it's, some, it's, it's something low, I thought. 50 would put you in the top half of 1%. Oh. Six would put you in the top, like, 8%. If you average one viewer, you're in the top, like, 45%. It, most of Twitch is unwatched. Most of Twitch is not watched at all. Not by anyone. Um, and in fact, if you have, I think it's 6.7 viewers, you're in the top, like, 10% or something like that. It, it's some, I, I don't have the exact number, but it's somewhere in there. Um, so what you're telling me is the three times that I have streamed, I have been as popular as Ninja. No. Because I was had like seven Ninja's people. in the top 0.001%, <laughs> you know. Let me, let me have my yeah. moment. But, but here's the thing, though, is, you, again, you have really, really big gaps between the things near the top that, that fall away. You get, you get this curve that is really, really, really steep on the left side. Where, mm-hmm. where the top people are, if you sort everyone on Twitch, and it falls off unbelievably quickly, you know, by a power law. And so what you have is, I bet if you looked at it on Twitch, uh, the, the t- av- top average viewers, that the next person is probably about half that, and the next prop person, probably about a third of that, and the next problem, probably about a fourth of that. I bet right. it would adhere to Ziff's law, at least on the aggregate, if you maybe group... If you maybe group streamers by like five at a time or something. And so Oof. this this underlying Ziff's law, again, Z-I-P-F, and there's a great video, or uh, excuse me, Vsauce video on this, uh, which I very much encourage you to watch. It is, it is spooky, and I think it emerges here. And the problem is, as more people come to Twitch, the curve will stay the same. The power rule will probably about stay the same. But because the, the raw number of viewers increases, and in terms of absolute numbers, that curve gets steeper, even if percentage numbers stays about the same. And so what's interesting is in the Internet era, you think of the Internet as this great equalizing force, right? It seems to actually be making these problems worse. Um, hmm. There was an interesting study about music, for example. What music gets listened to also adheres to Ziff's law, by the way. Um, and, and it turns out that that curve has actually gotten steeper in the streaming era, largely because more people are listening to music regularly because the, ba- the barrier to entry is lower. Mm-hmm. You know, you can give for a monthly subscription, you can listen to whatever you want. Or for ads, you can listen to whatever you want, right? And so what ends up happening is that curve actually looks steeper now than it did in the era of CDs, where it was actually expensive to produce an album and ship it everywhere. But with the barriers to entry lower, the steepness of that curve gets steeper. So we actually end up with more inequality. And again, inequality in this case, not, not in, a, in, a, in a moral sense or anything, but strictly in terms of a amount of listens a particular artist has, that, that share has actually gotten steeper than it was in the CD era 
where it was actually expensive to print CDs and ship them or print records and ship them even before that. So it, it's an what's interesting, interesting phenomenon. Me, Go ahead. It absolutely is. And what's interesting to me when I'm thinking about it is what are the driving forces behind these? Because mm-hmm. you could easily make an argument that the use of the and of as very general articles used in mm-hmm. a la- th- those sorts of words are going to be those connective tissues between words in yep. almost any language. I mean, it depends upon, again, depends on the language. But when you translate that over to the Internet or music, you're talking much more about uh, the 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 echo room sort of mentality, mm-hmm. the 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 feeding itself sort of mentality. If someone's listening to this, then more people listen to it, then more people listen to it. If people are on Twitter, more people on Twitter, and it kind of self fulfills itself. Those feel like two different forces, mm-hmm. but they end up coming to the same distribution, yeah. kind of like a like a golden ratio sort of yeah, exactly. maneuver. Right. So it might just be that there are just multiple different forces that point in the same way. Wow, yeah. that's uh, well so there's wow. there's also a mathematical explanation. So I'll just quickly give it and this is from the Vsauce video and this is let's say you have a pile of paper clips. And what you do is you you in some truly random clean them up. You well no, you so you have a pile of paper clips that are all separated. And you pick two paper clips truly at random and you connect them. And then you put it back down, mix up the pile, pick two at random, connect them. And if you pick up a chain not just one paperclip, but a paperclip that's already connected to a chain, you always attach to the end of a chain. If you do that for about half as many times as you have paperclips in the pile, no matter how big the pile is, in a true, if you do it truly randomly, you will end up with a Ziphian curve, where the largest chain will have twice as many paperclips on average as the next chain, you have three times as many as the one after that, four times as many as the one after that, and you have about half. You're not. You have uh, about half of the paper clips that are only in chains of two or in one. Not not half as many as the as the paper clips, but some number as many. If you you end up with a Ziphian curve if you do it enough times, so it just seems to emerge out of mathematical randomness. But it it, it also shows up in these things that we very much don't think of as random, like language or like music tastes or website selection or twitch streamers or solar flare intensity is also ziffian like the, uh, 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 um, the paperclip thing sounds like a fun saturday days night of me, the week so, in literature you know. are also ziffian the most co- if, if you Wait, if you what? look at <laughs> if you look at all of literature the most common day is about twice as common as the next most common day about three times as common as the next post, which I believe the most common is Sunday, and I believe the least referenced is either Tuesday or Thursday, or maybe Wednesday, I can't remember. But that is Ziphian, even though it's only seven. So there's this bizarre like- pattern that emerges almost everywhere we look for it. The global AI. Yeah. It's out to get us. Yeah. But th- this is this this keeps me up at night. Um, so I, oh. <laughs> so I, I think so. Again, getting back to the question, but why does it does see- it keep you up at night? One not one time is 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 the largest, mm-hmm. and the next is about half of that, and then the next night is no. About it keeps me up. It keeps me up every night. Um, but then again, maybe I'm the person who's kept up the most by the Ziphian phenomenon. The next person's only no. But so again, to get to the question of you know why does everyone why why is there this perception that there's like seven major websites that everyone uses and everything else is just like filler. I think there's social aspects, but I also think the Ziphian system emerges there, um, where, you know, there, there's a certain amount that we, we can't actually explain why Ziphian shows up so much. There's, there's mathematical models, but that doesn't solve the problem when we're talking about things that aren't explicitly random, like what website you visit. Um, but yet this still emerges, and, and I think it's one of those, you know, again, more people are using the internet, so the curve and absolute numbers get steeper. So the top seven websites are going to be viewed dramatically more than the next seven websites mm-hmm. combined. Wow. So I, I do think that's a factor, but I, I it's also just, you know, it's Ziphian. So I, I definitely something cool and spooky to look up in your spare time. Well, how about, how about we go to something else that was popular on the internet for a, a very long time, but is back in the realm of video games for a little bit. Mm-hmm. Okay. You ready for this hit? Yes. Do you remember Angry Birds, the original Angry Birds? Yes. The question is, 
is Angry Birds deterministic? Huh. So, for those of you that don't know the term deterministic, it basically means is there no randomness in the game? And the question is, is then if you uh, made the exact same attack with the bird, mm-hmm. would you always get the exact same answer? So there's two parts of this question that I want to tackle. First, is Angry Birds deterministic? And the second is the role of randomness. So what do you think? Well, so, how, so how is your how is your Angry Birds playing? Well, so first, let me let me let's talk a bit about what deterministic means broadly. So, OK, so I tried the, to he, do that, but apparently it wasn't good. No, enough. no, no. But but so here, here's the way I like to think of something as deterministic. Um, mm-hmm. if, if we were to say the universe were deterministic, if you could somehow hit a button just cause and okay. rewind the universe five seconds, exactly five seconds. To the exact state it was. All particles, all subatomic particles or quantum states, whatever, are exactly the same as they were five seconds ago and play the five seconds a hundred times. The idea of deterministic is that we'll always play exactly the same way. And I, and I like to think of it in those terms because, the, because this actually does get to the heart of the question. For example, the movement of the planets and asteroids that, that move in and out of our solar system uh, the planets, not so much, but the asteroids, certainly. Yeah, those planets just keep coming and going. It's well, Neil deGrasse Tyson I mean, hates Pluto, it. I mean, Pluto, but no. Um, <laughs> poor Pluto. Okay, um, okay, fair. But the thing is, is that often I'll hear from NASA, and they'll say, like, oh, yeah, there's, like, um, a 1 in 50,000 chance that this asteroid that's passing through our solar system is going to hit it. And I always think, well, well, wait. You have advanced computers. How can you not boil this down to it's going to hit us or it's not going to hit us? And it comes down to the reason they can't do that is because in every measurement, there's a certain amount of error. There's a certain marginal amount of error that you can't avoid. If you get a ruler out and you measure something in your house, you can maybe get down to 30 seconds of an inch. But beyond that, you can't get any more precise with your eyeball, right? And if you get better equipment, you can maybe get a more precise, but you're still going to be off by, in a best case, nanometers, right? And so, and in fact, because things are reshaping because of temperature, you can't get a precise temperature. And, and so the reason it becomes difficult to say if this asteroid's going to hit Earth, and, and much like an angry bird is going to hit a pig, right, is because mm-hmm. those tiny errors at the scale and the time frames we're dealing with make huge differences. Because when mm-hmm. we're talking about n-body gravitational simulations, which means all the systems in the solar system interacting with each other to gravity, because of course, the Earth, yes, it mostly revolves around the Sun, but we're pulled on a bit by Jupiter and Mars and Venus, right? That chaotic system means that if you try to simulate it too far ahead, the simulations change so much from those minuscule micro changes when you set up things that the whole system, the outcomes radically change based on just measurement errors when you start. And so that's why we can't tell an asteroid hits us. So now go ahead and tell me how that now, relates to Angry Birds. I was about to say, now let's get back to yes. celestial bodies, but, but the that, red, that, the that, red that bird. Matters. I think that matters. Oh, that's that's totally fair. But the error part is actually you're leading into it, right? So um, if you actually look at Angry Birds as a game, Mm -hmm. um, the engine that it uses, the original Angry Birds uses an engine called Box 2D. And this is a two dimensional game uh, uh, game engine that straight up is deterministic. Mm -hmm. It, it, It there is no there's no extra random numbers thrown into it. The randomness of Angry Birds comes from the impre- the imprecision, the, the unprecision, the bad precision, the whatever of you using your finger on a freaking touch screen. Yes. That's the error that is introduced or to make your it mouse to where, in a browser. Right. Or if you're using a mouse in a browser. And it turns out when people you know dug further into this, said, okay, yes, it's box 2D. We know from a programmatic perspective that it should be just fine, that it should be deterministic. Everything should happen exactly the same. Uh, Did tests and did the pixel perfect pullback of that bird. And sure enough, every single time it did what the the same thing was supposed to do. So would Angry Birds be 
any more or less fun if that error from the touch, let's just assume touchscreen, if that error wasn't there. Mm -hmm. Because randomness is something we intentionally put in game design. Yeah. Because that is part of what makes it interesting. Now, for those of you that um, have kids or have played games with kids, a game like Shoots and Ladders mm -hmm. is often not fun after a while for you because there is no randomness other than the just the spinning of the wheel or the roll of the die or whatever it is. That's it. Candyland is probably a better example. The only randomness is the shuffle of the deck. Basically, the, the outcome of the game is already determined. The purpose of these games is to teach kids how rules work mm -hmm. when learning to play future games. So having games, uh, it, it, pick anything that is based, in, uh, for example, anything that is based in a role-playing Dungeons & Dragons-esque universe. We have systems like Someone says this is 2d6, two dice rolls of a, of a, of a d6, of a mm -hmm. six-sided die, to get a value between 2 and 12. And there's an expected result with a peak around, you know, 7. Right. You know, that sort of... And not a 50 distribution in this case, but go ahead. No, no, not the at all. curve and, and um, normal distribution in this case. A, a normal distribution so that we have this notion of randomness. Uh, would a game like Dungeons & Dragons be less fun if there wasn't the critical 20 mm -hmm. or the critical fail, the rolling of the one. And so, you know, uh, what I think part of the appeal of Angry Birds, part of it was the notion that um, the imprecision of, of you getting your finger exactly right to feel like you had some agency and that um, that that error rate the distance between the mm -hmm. expected value and what you hope would happen is what kept people coming back to play. But and, and, it and was the just really interesting. also inherently chaotic because there's so many interactions that if you hit the same block, but with a slightly different, say, X, Y velocity, wildly different mm -hmm. things can happen because there's so many nested interactions in that. Um, of course, you did mention uh, a D6, and I'm going to argue a D6 is not random. There are robots that have been trained to always roll the same value on a D6. And they'll roll it. They're not like set it down, like drop it. They'll actually roll it. I was about it, to say. But, be, but they are so precisely programmed to do it. And this is where we get into, is anything like, random? So my daughter always rolls it uh, perfectly, too, because she'll roll the die. And then she'll say, oh, look. And then she'll flip the die over to the number she wants. So, I mean, <laughs> she, she's pretty good at it. Well, so but, No, but they're actually so they're. There is an interesting fact where things that appear random, like the roll of a dice, aren't actually right there. If you knew everything about the room, including like the air flow and everything, you could, given enough time, calculate what the dice roll is going to be based on its initial velocity, etc. And this is where I think it's fair to note random number generators in video games aren't random. Oh, well, that's true. I mean, they are they are deterministic, it, often based on the system clock. Oh, my God. Are we really going to dip back into the Ziffian Davis thing? No, no, Z no, no, Z no. I keep not, saying Ziff Davis. It's not going to so, be Ziffian. So, but so so we actually have a colleague or had a colleague that he didn't die. Uh, he left. You, uh, anyway, how about I stop with that part um, that was trying to work on uh, true randomness for cryptography mm -hmm. because cryptography always wants to have really big, nice, big random numbers. And he was using solar flares as the yeah. input as part of that, which you just made an argument about solar flares not being. Well, <laughs> so I, again, there's a difference uh, between something appearing random and something being random, I guess is what I'm trying to get at. And from a human perspective, something will appear random because the system is so complex and chaotic we can't meaningfully predict it. But that doesn't mean it's random. And so epistemologic, uh, epistemologically, I want to always ask the question, is there actually randomness in the universe? And I, and I, I don't claim to know that answer. I, I think there is, because I look at our student evaluations, and there's <laughs> a very good example of, of just randomness right there. No, it's just an incredibly chaotic system. It is an incredibly <laughs> chaotic system. You got our last yeah. question. I do. I, I, and, I, and I do like that question a lot. But uh, all right. So here it is. Uh, here's the question. Are you ready for it? Oh, I'm pins and needles. How do I tame an ocelot? 
Like the one from Metal Gear Solid? Uh, no, he was, like he the was, one from he was Archer. Pretty hard, Babu it, from Archer. Oh, I like I like Revolver Ocelot from Metal Gear Solid. How do you tame an ocelot? Yeah. Uh, uh, so where did this one come from? Where did this, so this question came from? from arcade, and specifically, this was about the game Minecraft, where you there are wolves oh. that which you can give bones to, and that will tame them and turn them into dogs. Which is basically an incredibly, incredibly abbreviated version of like five hundred thousand years of evolution, right? Um, but I'm going to come back to that in a second, actually. <laughs> but ocelots, you How? can also give something to them, and they will go. They will turn into cats. So, so I have a very fierce guinea pig. So I mm, think I am, I am quite qualified yeah. to talk about the taming of wild creatures because my guinea pig Charlie is. Incredibly vicious. Fearsome. Yeah. Incre- incredibly vicious. Yeah. Um, and typically what works on him is an excessive number of carrots. Mm-hmm. Okay. And that will just do it. So I'm thinking that, that an ocelot would need some other root vegetable. So I'm going to say I will hit it with a parsnip and that will, that will tame him. So there you go. Parsnips. So this is actually a, a, a really interesting. Um, so first. Ocelots really I'm going to ignore Sheriff's stupid answer really no, quick no, no, and no, keep I, going. I like that. Ocelots, <laughs> are, well, but no, this is going to get into why carrots won't work on ocelots. One, they're meat eaters. Um, but, like, you couldn't give, for example, rats. Like, feed rats to ocelots to tame them. Same way, you can't, you can't tame a snake even if you feed them regularly. Um, and this relates to, it, it turns out, so, so human beings largely evolved in Africa and then migrated outwards. Uh-huh. And yet the earliest signs of agriculture weren't in Africa. They were in largely the uh, Middle Eastern uh, right. uh, river valleys. Why? I remember this from world history. Why? Why not? Why, weren't, why wasn't agriculture earlier in Africa? One of the largest reasons is because of the ability to tame animals. So, for example, a zebra and a horse are very, very closely linked evolutionarily. But yet horses can be tamed. Zebras very much are incredibly difficult to tame. They are much more wild because they naturally produce right. more stress hormones. One of the diff- huh. one, one of the when dogs were tamed from wolves, it was because a particular group of wolves naturally produced less stress hormones. So they were naturally more tameable. And of course, then you get into humans actually breeding the better behaving dogs and you get artificial selection. But with natural selection, that happens as well. And so this is hmm. why many parts of the world that had the earliest large scale agriculture had beasts of burden. They had horses or oxen, whereas, you know, a wildebeest and a zebra, because they're in an area with much more aggressive predators, are much harder to tame. And similarly, the predators, naturally predators are harder to tame. Um, And so the cat family is a good example of this. If you look up, there's a really cute cat in like the um, in the the uh, far eastern Sahara around the Nile. And it looks like a house cat. cat. Well, just one breed. I can't remember the exact name, but it's, (laughs) it's small. It's a small cat. It looks like a particularly bushy house cat, and it is the deadliest. It is the deadliest hunter of, in the cat family. It is the cat that, when it goes out to hunt, is most likely to get a kill. And it's 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 it's, it's KDR is incredible. Exact, no, exactly, it is um, more so than ocelots, more so than lions. And it, if you look at it, it looks like a kitten. It looks tiny, but. You know that so so those stress hormones do play a, a big role. Now and it's how, really based good on at the, Overwatch. Based on the classic television show Archer, what I do know is you need to give it some toys or something, uh, because you know otherwise it gets easily bored and sprays on things. That's just based on the TV show Ooh. Archer, uh, in honor of much Babu. like your vicious, much like your vicious kitties. Yes, well, my kitties are very sweet. But yeah, so it, except when they're fighting during lectures. So how do you tame an ocelot? You don't. Like we've all watched. Ti- oh. We all were in quarantine. We all watched Tiger King, right? Don't try to tame wild cats. You you can't. 
It you, they're wild because their their stress levels are so high. So you're 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 kind of a monster. Uh, and 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 frankly, leave Carol Baskins alone. Is I I think what <laughs> we should end this with. Why? Why is the answer to this not? It's Minecraft. You you yeah. You, you just give them some pun, item. You punch it. Yeah, you punch a tree four times. You get some wood and grass, and you make a a hut. And then all of a sudden, they're your pet. Yeah. I mean, it's a video game. No logic should apply here. It should not be deterministic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you should just get just get the pet that you want. Yeah. Well, Minecraft, oh, it gracious. is. You just give them some item. And there's a random, again, question if it's truly random, but random chance that that item tames them. And that's pretty much it. And that's pretty much it. And that's pretty much it for us today. Thank you all so much for hanging out with us for this bit of time. If you are, if you've enjoyed what's been going on, we'd really appreciate it if you would subscribe or leave us a review on the podcast service of your choice. If you go to regraderequest.com, you will find links to the podcast on iTunes, Google Podcasts, Spotify, every other place I could find to that we were supposed to submit the podcast and even on my YouTube channel. So if you would like to subscribe to any of those, we'd very much appreciate it. Ratings and reviews are also appreciated. And starting as soon as people actually start sending them to us. Yes. If you go to regraderequest.com, you will now see a button uh, uh, done through the um, anchor FM system, which is, has been a fantastic podcast host. I've mm-hmm. been very impressed with their system. Um, you can leave us an audio message. If you would like to leave us a question, send us a question for us to regrade. We would love to hear from you. So again, that's regraderequest.com to sub- to subscribe. Also to leave us a message. You can find me on Twitter at Mark Sheriff. You can find McBurney at Prof McBurney. Yep. And that'll do it. Watch Thanks for falling again. goats. And watch for falling goats. Take care, everyone. Thank you. I hear they I I hear they fall in a Ziffian format and they're deterministic. Um, I don't think they're Ziffian.